Hi, Christy. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very well, thank you. Excellent. Now, before we get started on our topic, can you tell us a bit about your journey with um, early childhood? How did it start? Yeah, so I have been working on and off in early childhood for oh, about 11 or 12 years. So essentially, I started working with the YMCA who has um, early learning and um, uh, after school cares. So, and now I currently have clients uh, within ThinkSafe solutions that are schools and have ELCs and OSHAs as well. Wow. And with the why, did you do um, the entire organisation or just the ch early childhood side? The whole organisation. So I was uh, an executive manager for the Safeguarding Children and Young People Health and Safety and HR. Wow. That was a big role. It was big. <laughs> a lot of responsibility. Very now, and, and of course, with that responsibility, let's Talk about legislative responsibilities um, that in the early learning sector, service owners are often surprised or shocked to learn about. Yes. Um, what's your experience with that? Yeah, so um, I find that a lot of services, um, be it whether it's childcare schools or um, after school hours, um, they're, they're surprised that they're still duty holders under legislation, under work health and safety legislation. So although it is heavily regulated with the national regulations, there's still a, a duty of care and responsibilities under Work Health and Safety Act and regulations. So I find explaining that although the national regs sometimes has a overlap with the Health and Safety Act and regs, there are areas that are not covered under the national regs that still need to be upheld for a workplace. Well, can you give me some examples of those? Yeah, so um, essentially the, uh, I had one just last week actually, when it comes to the emergency uh, management. So although the national regs does um, specifically talk about that you have to do your, um, your, sorry, it's just escaped me, your, <laughs> uh, the, pa the pressure of podcasts. <laughs> Um, you have to have your go out and do your. I can't think of it. I'm so sorry, Paula. That's okay. So no, 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 look, look, with that, then what's the difference that when you're talking about national regulations through a CEQA and through mm. government bodies, of course, mm. then right down to your state bodies through mm. the Department of Education. Mm. Effectively, what you're saying is the work health safety regulations is outside of that and service providers, nominated supervisors, still have a duty of care. 100%, absolutely, definitely, okay. yeah. And um, with with that, what sort of penalties or what sort of um, things can they expect if they aren't following those regulations? So they that's what uh, another thing that isn't understood is that the, the regulator of the state or territory still would come in and, and do their... Um, inspections and everything in, in that time. So it's not just the the national quality standards that would be investigating, it would be the regular of that regulator of that area as well. Right. So right. yeah. So what, what would be um, the way around it for a service provider? They're listening to our podcast, they're going, what do I do? Who do I contact? How do I know I'm meeting these regulations? What's best practice? Yeah, so best practice is, um, policy and procedure, definitely. Having a really good risk management framework around you, so that helps meet a lot of the, the health and safety regulations. Um, essentially, knowing your duty under the Work Health and Safety Act. So you have from your officer right down to your worker, so everybody holds duty under Work Health and Safety. Understanding that and having those conversations. It, it would have been taught within um, the qualifications that anybody has to do to obtain that Cert 3, Cert 4 diploma. It's just understanding that that still applies moving forward in addition to the national yes. And And look, you know, it's a busy, busy time in, sec in the sector at the moment across Absolutely. all services. And yep. you, they would be forgiven for not remembering it or not thinking about it because there's so much to do. Um, and often paperwork 
can also be a hindrance because they're not using effective systems. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's the compliance and the recording that is usually the part that is, is fallen down. Right. And, and um, I, know, I know you're a consultant, so you could help services do this as well. Yeah, That's absolutely. Important. So, right. yeah. Yep, this is what ThinkSafe does. We come in, we assess, we provide a report to help you to understand the areas that you're meeting and not meeting, exactly the same kind of thing as the framework for the national regs. And we help you to um, understand those gaps and can also provide the IP and training to be able to lift you up and and move through to help you get compliant. And just to confirm, because I I know this is a a topic that people get confused about shut off as well. If a child falls over in a service, that mm-hmm. is also work health safety in that incident. Absolutely. Yeah, right? absolutely. Right. Correct. Okay. Yes, it's so. not just staff. <laughs> it's about the area, you know, the, the service in total. It's providing a safe place. Right. Yeah, and that could even be parents or, or contractors work, walking in. Anybody. Anybody, yep. right. And Anybody. excursions, of course, if they take the children off site. The, the workforce safety still applies. Yeah. So you've just all you've done there is you've actually shifted now your your place of of work or your place of service. So essentially, the same principles apply. It's just that you've moved things. Yes. And look, is there any um, regulations as such? Uh, we, we're going to talk about um, the tracking and trending that we discussed yep. prior to our, our podcast. Yep. Um, is there any regu- requirements to have that tracking and have those comparisons? Yeah. I, I believe there is something in place yeah. that they must show trends and things like that. Absolutely. So that comes back to the risk management side of things. So um, a a PCBU, which is the principal conducting business, so that's usually the service or the, you know, the hire, the, the owner of the company. Yeah. Um, they have to have systems and processes in place um, to follow to assess risk and manage hazards. So essentially that's that's all part of the risk framework, which is what services do when they go on excursions. They create risk assessments, they identify risks and hazards, they control those, and if everything looks good, then they continue on with their excursion. It's, yeah. yeah. And who comes and checks those? Um, they can be checked, they'll be checked as part of the, um, your quality compliance. Um, but that's something that I, an auditor can come in and do if there was anything that ever happened. So, um, hopefully it doesn't. However, if, uh, anything ever happened in the service or on an excursion, one of the first things that the regulator is going to ask for is your documentation. So your risk assessment. So they need to understand the process that took place in order to get to the stage for that to happen. They want to see that the risk was reviewed. Right. Okay. And and once again, this is still different to those trends and comparisons from checks and things. This is your risk register, yep. your risk appetite, for want of yep. a better word. Um, and when when your auditor or the regulator comes in, mm-hmm. can they do spot checks as well? Can any Absolutely. service be spot checked? Yep. Yep. They have authority to come in and spot check whenever they like. Right. Yep. Do you know if that happens often? Is that something that's done? It does. It's more in the building and construction industry that happens a lot more, but no industry, it's still all regulated by the same regulator. (laughs) So they just pick and choose as they go through. So, I mean, if... If a state or territory had a number of, so actually I do know of one. One happened not long ago in um, Brisbane where there was a repeated um, child um, uh, were put into hospital into emergency care because they were falling ill. So the regulator actually came out and inspected their site to understand, A, if it's a you know, something that needs to be reported. Um, and if the the actual service is controlling, so if they're doing their cleaning checks, if they're doing all the things that they're meant to be doing to ensure that if it is something that is contagious, it's being contained and we're taking the right steps. Right. So could that be like, oh, just off the top of my head, given the floods across the East Coast over the last yep. two years, yep. there's a lot of mould. So yep. there are, would be some kids that would be susceptible to that. So if cleaning's not done properly. 100%. That yep. 
that could be one thing yeah. um the other could also be like if you know um uh say contagious um diseases like chickenpox or something yeah Is that another issue yep absolutely yeah so they work with the health department and can and come in and, and view yep wow okay so it's right down to everything so if that like i said that child in hospital mm -hmm. um so because it's repeated yep it's a, it's a flag yeah, absolutely. It starts flagging in the system. Yeah. Right. Oh, fantastic. Now, with that, um, it, it obviously would pay to have um, a, your, your, your risk and your assessments in, in a system of some sort rather than the regulator walks in and it's a mess. Absolutely. Um, some um, organisation to show yeah. that you are on top of that. Yeah, absolutely. Document control. <laughs> Document control. That's exactly right. And and also, um, would it be like a historical thing? So having that yeah. data yeah. to show that we do this regularly. Yeah. So there's all sorts of legislation around which um, I know a lot of the people listening to this will understand with childcare that you have to keep documents for certain periods of time, 25 years, 50 years, some health and safety is seven years. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Historically, if you need to be able to go back on documents, you must be able to recall them. So having systems, uh, online systems in place, obviously hugely assists with that recalling from an archive box out the shed it's not great <laughs> no and that can often be that there's floods water mold insect yeah. who knows what from yeah. there um, or what fire goes through and you can't actually get those you can then unfortunately receive penalties for not meeting your requirements under legislation to retain those documents oh wow so i was actually going to ask you that what happens in a fire <laughs> Because yep. that's sort of one of the questions we get. Yeah. Often is about, you know, um, yeah. how documents are stored in online so, pro, uh, products and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and, and I always say, well, if a fire goes through, what actually does happen? Yeah. So there's a possibility that, you know, circumstances are obviously going to be reviewed. But yeah, I mean, years ago, we didn't have the ability to have cloud based systems and those <laughs> kind of things. So we've come a long way. <laughs> um, <laughs> But essentially, this day and age where there is the opportunity for cloud-based systems and online systems, it, it would be frowned upon if you weren't able to recall those. No, yeah, no, no, that's fair enough. Totally fair enough. Oh, wonderful. Look, now, um, with all of this, looking forward for the sector, what do you think the big issues are for early, early learning? Yeah, so mine kind of all tie in together. So my my two top ones that um, I have thought of are cost of living, and I can go into it a bit more, and the compliance side of things. Yes. So yeah. the cost of living um, is it's kind of a two prong um, section for work health and safety and how it's going to affect services. So essentially with the introduction in some of the states and territory of the psychosocial hazards, the new legislation that's coming into effect or has come into effect as of March, yes. um, essentially that paired with cost of living is going to put pressure on um, companies, organisations or services, um, essentially in areas because with psychosocial hazards, uh, employers now have to be able to identify and control um, psychological hazards within their workplace. So um, some examples of that are effects of health and wellbeing, um, job satisfaction, higher stress, um, burnout, uh, anxiety, low productivity, um, absenteeism, they're going to have to all be controlled under this new legislation that's being brought out. So cost of living is affecting both our families and our workers um, because it's putting added pressure everywhere and now there's added legislation that's involved where we have to now control it. <laughs> Which is almost possible to a degree it's it is there there's a lot of uh information out there and the code of practice that has been put out by safe work australia has been adopted in most states and territories um and it is fantastic it is a very thick read but it it's very good it provides controls it provides 
pretty much any everything that you're going to need to be able to manage that in a very easy to read document. And at the end of the podcast, we might share this. Um, yeah, yep. okay I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fabulous. We'll put that in yeah. with, um, with our links. Yeah, so that, that way it's easy access and anything else you want to share that you think is important yep. um, as well. Um, with ThinkSafe, what sort of strategies would or do you have a strategy in mind that you would, you know, you could share with us about what um, services could do? At a, at a centre level to help mm -hmm. combat those um, pressures. Absolutely. So it's simple. There's simple things such as um, ensuring all of your workers have a job description so they know what their role is, they understand what's expected of them. Um, you know, it's going into the HR side of things as well, but it does overlap, you know, making sure that um, there's a strong change management process within a service. So if there's, uh, if you have a service that regularly makes changes and updates things, to make sure that there's a process in place to keep people updated and understood in, in what's happening. So essentially communication is the key and it's huge in health and safety, um, but it's going to become more and more evident that it is so important with the introduction of the new legislation. And of course, with the legislation comes the regulators in to check that that's what you're doing. Yes, and because this is the first introduction for quite some time of something this large, it, it will be getting assessed. Yes. Yes, I can imagine. And yep. I, like you said, just those simple communication of change um, <laughs> is, is such a pressure on staff. Yeah. yeah. They're not expecting it. And they're doing a lot, you know, of course, anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm and that's that. where it ties back so strongly into childcare. We know that it's a high burnout, you know, industry. Um, we understand that they have higher workloads. It's physically demanding, all of those things. So really getting a good understanding of this new legislation is so important for the services. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, we'll share that documentation, but they can also yeah. contact you, Christy. Absolutely. We'll have all the links for you as well yep. in um, in the podcast at the end yep. here. Um, now, before we finish up, what we'd love to do is ask you for some wise words um, yep. that, that you'd like to share. Do you have anything you'd like to share with us, Christy, and how has it come about? Yeah. So my motto in work, health and safety and in life is if you see it, own it. If you walk by, you can donate it. So um, it's something that I heard very early on in starting my career in health and safety, and it was something that I could so easily adapt to both my personal life and my working life, as well as my safety professionalism. So um, just understanding that, you know, if you're seeing something, you, you have a voice, you should speak up. If it's unsafe, you have the authority to stop it. Um, if you, if you accept it, then you've accepted that behaviour now. So it's going to be harder to make positive changes and ensure compliance if you're condoning behaviour that's not in line with policy and procedure and compliance. Yes. And I suppose what we were talking about earlier about the changes coming through mm -hmm. with legislation, with work health, safety um, and well-being, this is mm -hmm. part. That would actually apply Absolutely. it very well. Yeah. yeah and that's a wonderful motto. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hey, Christy. Now, look, can we go back and maybe you've remembered now before we end um, yep. about the example you're going to share with us? Yes. So it was on a veg emergency evacuation procedures. So I went into a school the other day to do an audit and I was specifically auditing emergency management. Um, so the school has a ELC attached to it. So when I went in, they had everything perfect. They had their maps, they had their procedures, they were doing their um, procedures every three months. However, the one thing that they didn't have was actually someone trained as a warden. So essentially there was a, a gap there. So there's best practice under work health and safety stating that you should have a, a specific amount per um, per head in each service or workplace that is trained externally as a work, uh, a warden or a chief warden. So the that training 
ensures that they know what to do in the in the moment of an emergency so yeah. everything else was perfect it, it was just that one part where there was not actually someone appointed as a warden or a chief warden so in the in the event of an actual emergency and not just a routine procedure taking place it could have been a scramble to know who was actually in charge who would speak to emergency services, um, you know, who would be in control of the situation. Yeah, and, and where that comes into effect is even, like you just mentioned, ringing emergency services, yes. you could have 20 people ringing. Absolutely, not and that's not what one. you want in that moment. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, and with that, obviously, there would be a staff member on site um, and it would either be chief warden or a warden. Is there training? Like, is that what Think yes. Safe would do? Do they do the training for that, or is there training colleges? Yeah, training. So any fire um, fire department. So not sorry, not the fire department. So uh, in the Northern Territory, um, I work with Defend Fire. So they come in, they provide a, a two to three hour training session. Wow. Within the training session, they go through the legislative requirements. They help them to understand the steps that need to be taken. And then at the end of it, you actually um, do a virtual um, reality of uh, putting out a fire with a fire extinguisher. It's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's good fun. Yeah, it's good. It's uh, brilliant if training. Doing, yeah, if you're doing it in the car park with any children mm. watching, that's quite exciting. Yeah. Well, by them bringing in the virtual reality, they've uh, taken away the requirement to get permits for lighting up a bin and have people put out a fire in the middle of a car park. So it's very... It's very good thinking of them. Wow, yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, of course, our, our audience could reach out to you as well, Chrissy, at Think Safe. Absolutely. For further information on any of the topics that we've just discussed today and more Absolutely. on health safety. Yep. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I thank appreciate you. your time. And you. I love your motto, if you see it, own it. If you walk by, you condone it. Yep. That's thank it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paula.